Welcome to Frankly Speaking, broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio here on Marcus Street. I'm your host, Frank Akam. We're going to get right to it this morning because what an exciting show. Uh, if this is your first time joining us because you saw the Facebook post or if you are a regular viewer, we really appreciate it because our guest today, the rock and roll pioneer, the rock and roll legend, Dwayne Eddy is going to be our guest. Dwayne Eddy, uh, born in Corning, New York. So we're going to talk with him about that time in his life being in the Southern Tier, and we'll talk about his legendary career. That's coming up in just a little bit. Also, you can get your last-minute questions, or just if you want to comment about the program, especially if it is your first time watching, if you want to say, hey, Frank, this is what I think about the show, good, bad, or indifferent, I'd love to hear from you. We try to read uh, emails and texts as frequently as we can. We have a lot of exciting interviews coming up next week. Maybe we'll get to that announcement a little bit later on, but just know that for today and tomorrow, tomorrow, of course, Good Friday, uh, we're going to play back-to-back -back interviews with Dwayne Eddy. We had a nice conversation uh, for, for two days' worth of shows. So we uh, hopefully, by the end of the program, have a little bit of time to uh, talk about the news of the day. Uh, most of that centers around um, former President Trump. Uh, a lot of it centers around the budget negotiations still going on in New York. We have a couple other uh, quick stories that we may be able to get to, maybe not. But again, thank you for joining us this morning. And thank you to all of those people who have stopped me on the street or have reached out to me and said that they've made this a part of their morning routine. Well, please tune in every weekday at 7 right here on WYDC TV Big Fox. So let's take our first short break. And when we come back, we will hear from the legend himself, Dwayne Eddy. That's coming up in just a moment. So please... Stay with us. Right, folks. Welcome back to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV, Big Fox, broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio. We have just a moment. I know I said Dwayne Eddy coming up next. I'm looking at my format here. We have just a moment before we'll be uh, sitting down with the legend himself. A couple of quick housekeeping things. Uh, Next week, we have a full lineup, like I said. I, we will be talking with uh, uh, Desi Arnaz, or Lucy Arnaz, excuse me. Lucy Arnaz, um, the daughter of uh, Lucy and Desi. Uh, she's going to talk about a, an issue that's very important to her. That's coming up next week. Uh, we have uh, Allison Hunt. She is on the uh, Corning City Council, and she's running for uh, Steuben County Legislature. We'll be talking to her next week. So we'll keep you updated on all of those. But I wanted to hit my contact information just one more time because I want any last minute questions you have, uh, whether it's for Dwayne, for upcoming guests, for me. Because um, again, I think uh, this has got some uh, word of mouth going, this interview, because there's been a push, if you're not familiar, and uh, we'll get this out of the way because I, I don't talk, I'm not going to talk with Dwayne necessarily about it, but uh, a while back, Dwayne uh, finally got into the Steuben County Hall of Fame. Uh, and it was a really special event. It was kind of in the middle of COVID, so it was all done over video, but it was, it was very special. Um, and there's been a, some rumblings behind the scenes, uh, whether it's just people stopping me on the street, whatever the case may be, where we think in Corning maybe there should be a plaque, a sign on your way into town. So I would love to have your opinion of what should be done for Dwayne Eddy. Born in Corning, always very proud of that fact. As I said the other day on the program, it was in all of his uh, publicity, his album covers, always uh, mentioned the fact that he was born in Corning, New York. So what can we do as a community to honor our uh, hometown boy makes good? Uh, so I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I've heard everything from a plaque to a statue to a monument. <laughs> uh, but if you have any ideas, because I would love to reach out to some of our elected leaders and, and just make some suggestions. I know there's a lot of uh, great groups around here, community minded groups that would uh, love to do something uh, to honor Dwayne Eddy. So let's uh, hear from you and get your thoughts on it. And uh, maybe uh, we can all brainstorm on how we can help forward that process, uh, that progress, that process, because we do seem to have some momentum going. Uh, there's been some for a little while now, a couple years, uh, a couple years back, there was a push to get him into the Steuben County Hall of Fame when that happened. I think everybody said, wow, that's wonderful. Uh, what more can we do? So if you have any ideas, you can reach me there. Now I've got to take that last break before we talk to Dwayne Eddy. I promise this time. So stay with us. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking, broadcasting live from the Hesselson Studio on Marcus Street here in Corning. Dwayne Eddy coming up next. Mm -hmm. 
Welcome back to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV Big Fox. And this is the M.A. Neal Financial Services section of our program. And we are joined by the legendary Dwayne Eddy. Dwayne, it's so good to see you. Well, it's nice to be seen. <laughs> At my age, it's nicer to be seen than viewed. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for being on the show. I know the show's relatively new, but we're broadcasting in the the same area that you were born in. Tell us about your time in our area and specifically being born in Corning, New York. Corning, New York. I was always very proud of that mm-hmm. because everywhere I'd go and whenever they'd interview me and ask where I was born, I'd say Corning and they'd say, where's that? I said, you know, Corning, New York, Corning Glass. <laughs> and uh, wherever in the world is famous all over the world. So. Mm-hmm any further yeah yep and you spent not as much time in corning but you've been uh, grew up in the surrounding areas to a point right yeah we lived in corning for the first several years and then we moved up to bath mm-hmm. for a few more years and then on up to north of branchport and keuka lake oh sure west of branch yeah and guy yeah. little crossroads yeah when you look back at your time uh, in our area, what do you think of? What are the fond memories? Was it a place that you loved? Oh, yeah. yeah. I loved it because uh, my dad was a bread man for a company called Cabaco. Oh, okay. And uh, he used to go leave the house at four in the morning or something. And I, sometimes he'd take me with him as I was getting older. And uh, I'd ride with him. He drove almost 100 miles a day wow. to, and serviced the bread to all the little shops and stores out in the country and crossroads and places like that and, and within an area around Corning. And uh, I love walking in that bakery and Corning is <laughs> on the mix of gasoline and baked food. <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds silly, but it, it was a pleasant combination and it sure. changed every once in a while. And of course, once I got in the truck, all I could smell was the Hopefully, what I would get later, a cupcake. <laughs> so, with that much traveling, you actually saw a lot of the area in a short period of time, hundreds of I miles. Did. Yeah, he went up along the, well, and then when he went to Bath, he worked for NBC uh, there, in their bakery, and uh, yeah, we'd go all up and down the Finger Lakes and uh, cross over the mountains there and do the mountains between them and mm-hmm. uh, the hills whatever you want to call them yeah. and then when I lived in Guyanoga I was seven miles over to Penyan where I went to junior high school mm-hmm. seventh and eighth grade yeah. then we moved to Arizona well, but I, speaking specifically of your time in Penyan uh, people may not know this but you were responsible for their, their mascot yes I uh, they had a contest I think when I was in well, one of the two grades seventh or eighth and uh, I used to love to draw horses, yeah. and uh, I loved horses. And uh, so I, they wanted somebody to name the team and everything. So I put in, uh, drew a horse, and called it the, uh, the Mustang. Yeah, still called the Mustangs today. It's still there today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When did you pick up guitar? Was it while you were in the area, or is that when you moved to Arizona? No, that was when uh, we moved from Corning to Bath, and I didn't know it, but my dad had a acoustic guitar, mm-hmm. and we were loading some coal into the new house for the furnace, and uh, I looked over, I said, what's that, Dad? He said, oh, he looks, he says, that's a guitar, what's it for? He says, well, you play it, like a musical instrument, mm-hmm. and he says, I used to court your mother. <laughs> did did you know right away that you were going to take to it? I mean, was it one of those things you just couldn't put down? Well, I asked him to show me how it worked, and uh, he played a three or four chords, which was about the limit of his knowledge on it, maybe five chords, something mm-hmm. like that. And uh, so I could, uh, he taught them to me, and I just kept playing, kept trying, and uh, hurt my fingers. <laughs> They had to grow calluses, which mm-hmm. never really did, but they did get tough. Oh, sure. And, uh, anyway, I could play several chords. I didn't know you could play up the neck for the longest time. <laughs> and <it> between anything. <laughs> and, uh, That's funny. Well, I used to sing, play and sing uh, Happy Birthday for the neighbor kids. And, uh, yeah. 
things like that. And then I, uh, in the seventh grade, I think I sang a couple songs in an assembly at Penn Oh, wow. And uh, let's see, what else? Oh, went to Hormel. Oh, yeah. And did a radio show. Uh, I took two or three lessons on the lap steel. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And uh, I wanted guitar, but my folks like the Hawaiian guitar, so <laughs> that's what I got lessons yeah. on. But I only took about three of them, and then I just rebelled. <laughs> did I not want to go. But during that time, because <laughs> everything he taught me, I could play instantly. It was just natural for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he took me with him to his little 15 minute radio show, and we played Missouri Waltz. And uh, I played the lead on that. Yeah. And, uh, did you? Nice. Did you know that that's what you wanted to do as a career at a young age, or was it just a hobby at that point? It was just a hobby. I, yeah. I didn't know that even after I started working at 15 in Arizona. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we moved to Arizona in 1951, and uh, in Tucson, and uh, then my dad went to work for Safeway there and got, worked his way up to assistant manager and a year or so later we moved to Coolidge which was a small town halfway between Tucson and Phoenix okay. and they had a radio station and this guy uh, my dad of course being a dad said my son <laughs> plays guitar to the disc jockey when he came in to go shopping yeah. and uh, the disc jockey Jim Doyle uh, said we'll bring him out to the transmitter we'll, cut, we'll record something and yeah. if it turns out okay we'll put it on the air yeah he did, and that started a whole thing. So your parents were supportive of going into oh, to yeah. music? Yeah. Well, in those days, nobody, they don't think they expected me to earn a living. You know. <laughs> but after they played that on the radio, a friend called, uh, Jimmy Dell, and he called up, and we said, come to my house and play music. Yeah. And uh, he played piano, and I played guitar, and we sang together country songs, and... So we did that around the area and uh, just had fun with it, parties and stuff, yeah. school dances, whatever. And uh, then, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think where I was going with that. Yeah. Well, oh, then uh, after that, this local country group called and wanted me to play with them at the VFW, and they said, it pays $15. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe that in 1953 or four. Yeah. Uh, you get fifteen dollars for playing the guitar it just seemed ridiculous. <laughs> but I knew all their songs and stuff and solos on the records, so I, uh, I, I said uh, we yeah. rehearsed it and then we did the gig and uh, that started me working. Was country your biggest influence? Is that who you listen to? Country music? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Hank Williams was my man. Yeah. The guy, my mentor, sort of. And uh, from him I learned, uh, I just by observing and listening, I realized he was doing his own style, his yeah. own sound, and he did it with authority. Mm -hmm. Is that when you realized you had to come up with your own sound? You had to be different than everyone else? Well, all the country artists did. You mm -hmm. know, I could hear the first two bars of any new song by a country artist and know what it was just by the sound of the, right. the intro, mm -hmm. the steel guitar. Or the, they had different tones, mm -hmm. things, or the guitar, yeah. and, the fiddle. and whatever it was, they had their, all had their own sound. Hank Snow did, sure. uh, Lefty Fell, mm -hmm. and uh, you could just tell them about just a couple of bars who it was going to be before I heard the voice. Yeah. We have to take a short break, but Dwayne Eddy's promised he's going to stay with us through the break. So stay with us. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking yeah. here on WYDC-TV Big Five. Welcome back to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV Big Fox. This is the M.A. Neal Financial Services interview, and we're broadcasting from the Hesselson studio. Dwayne Eddy is our guest, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Musician Hall of Famer, and recent Steuben County Hall of Famer. Congratulations. That's the one I'm proud of. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's something about your home, your hometown uh, recognizing you that's mm -hmm. 
better than all the rest. I'm sure. I'm sure. Do you still have connections to our area? Uh, yes, I do. I uh, I have some friends in Scottsdale, Arizona, that uh, their families are in here. Oh, wow. But other than that, and my, of course, my relatives are all in Tawanda and Alba, Pennsylvania, just 20 miles below the border. Mm-hmm. And my cousins and, what? and uh, nephews and nieces. What was it that brought your family to Corning in the first place? Was it the, the bakery job? Pardon? What was it that brought your family to this area in the first place? Was it the bakery job that your father had? No, 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 no. He had uh, three brothers, and they uh, they grew up in Tawanda and oh, okay. Lakeland. They were born in Lakeland, which no longer exists. Mm. South of Tawanda, it was a lumber town. They clear-cut it, and then they <laughs> picked everything up, all the buildings and the railroad tracks, and left to the meadow, <laughs> which it is now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So before we went to break, we were talking about kind of the beginnings of getting into the guitar. When did you feel that your career had taken off? Um, well, I didn't know. You never know from record to record whether it's going to last. Sure. Uh, but I cut late 57, there was a record called Launchy that was a top 10 record by two different artists mm-hmm. and the guitar instrumental. And... Uh, so uh, by then I'd met my producer. He came to Coolidge as a DJ. Okay. And then wanted to be a producer, so he became one. And he got one hit in 56, 1956, Sanford Clark. And uh, Lee Ruff produced. And then uh, in 57, he, uh, he wanted to try an instrumental. So he said, go on and write one. And so I did. And mm. It was called Moving and Grooving. Yeah. They released that in January. It got the Billboard charts at seventy something, wow. which encouraged them to say, "Go back and do some more," which we did in March and just past March sixteenth. Yeah, not long ago, which is the day we cut Rebel Rouser, and that was released in April or so, and somewhere around there at the end of April, I think, and it became a big hit of the summer. Yeah, pretty much. It's amazing to me. I don't think there's any movie that takes place in that time that doesn't include Rebel Rouser. Yeah. It it's so like synonymous that. with that time. Fine with me. <laughs> Keep I them coming. I in a movie. <laughs> Forrest Gump was the biggest one. They, uh, they sold uh, over 14 million albums on that soundtrack. Wow. <laughs> they had a little help from Elvis. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and others. Well, and you mentioned Elvis. You've had an opportunity, I'm sure, to meet just about everybody in the business. Just about, yeah. yes. Yeah. I had a very nice experience with Elvis. Yeah. We uh, tried to get in the show, and we couldn't. It was sold out. But, uh, yeah. We went in afterwards, and a little friend went down. And uh, <clears throat> so we got backstage afterward, and uh, um, he invited me. I met him, and that was nice. And uh, he said, uh, come on up to the penthouse. We're having a going away. This was his last night. Oh, okay. A going party for all the people that worked on the show and all that sort of thing at the hotel. So I did him up. Of course, I knew all his musicians and worked with him for years. Sure. Sat and talked to him for a while. And then here he came, and uh, he came right over and started talking to me. And uh, we had a great conversation mm-hmm. and uh, it continued off and on. Because he would interrupt it to go greet people and talk to them, and he, his manners were impeccable. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> southern gentleman is a southern gentleman. And yeah. you can't duplicate it. No. But he was treating these people so nice, and they just were loving him. Mm-hmm. And uh, but he'd work his way back to me, and and uh, so we talked. We talked. And he and Priscilla was there too. Uh, he and I and Priscilla talked to about seven in the morning and finally he <laughs> had come down from the show yeah wow. he asked me he said did you see the show i said no we couldn't get in <laughs> it all me. Said, yeah because i got some influence around here <laughs> and i said well i would never pursue yeah. no what is it like now when someone comes up to you and talks about how big of an influence you were in their career 
that's the reward I never knew I'd get. Yeah. That's uh, about all I can say about it. This is a, a, a wonderful feeling. Yeah. I mean, especially uh, somebody like uh, I don't know, John Fogarty or something. Yeah. Was that? Yeah. You know, 16% of our playbook was Dwayne Eddy songs. And, uh, and he tells in interviews that I, you know, that he was the guy. Well, I was the, his guy for, um, you know, learning off of. And uh, there's been several, yeah. you know, like that. He said, I started playing guitar because of you. Ones that blew my mind, kind of, were two jazz player uh, players. Uh, bass and guitar player out at the Big Potato in California, Don Randy's place, and uh, I went in one night and he said, you got to hear these guys, they're really good. And so I, I listened to them, they, they just play jazz. Yeah. I, I like, I don't play it, <laughs> to speak of, but I, I like it, listen to it now and then. And uh, anyway, they both came up to me afterward and they said, They'd come from the San Fernando Valley, and they'd heard my records. And one guy said, because of that, those records, he says, I played bass. And the other one says, yeah, and because of those records, I played guitar. Wow. He said, we learned all your stuff, and then we would progress from there, went on, and uh, and became jazz. Uh, we had some training, and sure. uh, musical training, and learned about theory and all that, and then we became jazz players. Wow. we got to take another short break. But we'll be right back with Dwayne Eddy. A lot more to get to, so stay with us. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking. Welcome back to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV Big Fox. We're being joined by Dwayne Eddy. Dwayne, you've had such an amazing career. Are there moments that really stick out to you that are very memorable? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, First time I played the Hollywood Bowl in California. That was one. I call them moments, you know. Yeah. That, uh, uh, first time I worked with James Brown up in the Northwest, uh, he was didn't have any hits then, but his show was so good. Yeah. I, 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 when I could, I'd ask the promoter to let him close the show. Yeah. Uh, because I felt I like to do that anyway, because the instrumentals didn't seem as strong as vocals in some of those live shows. Yeah. But they were powerful and strong, but. They'd been singing, they'd been hearing vocals the whole show. Sure. And I come up and play instrumentals with them. It'd be nice to have a, a, a vocal actor, so I always encouraged that. And uh, But James was knocked out with it. He thought that was the nicest thing could happen to him. And he, and he knew he should have been there anyway. But, he, but the shows matched him up. And uh, so that was a moment. And uh, playing the Grand Ole Opry in 1996. Wow. 17th, I, that was a childhood dream. I never knew how I'd do it. But yeah. That was a, a dream for me, and uh, one of those moments. And I got to play with Chet Atkins. Oh, wow. And we played a Hank Williams song together. So oh. <laughs> Perfect. Patrick, when, like, when you play the Grand Ole Opry, it, I know you've played all over the country and all over the world. Is it still a little intimidating to play at the Grand Ole Opry? No, it's um, oddly enough, it was before I played it. But once I got on the stage, I found that it was the most comfortable stage I'd ever really? been on. No kidding. The acoustics are wonderful in there. Yeah. And uh, and everything sounds great, and it just has a warmth, uh, uh, friendly feeling that um, from the audience and yeah. just the walls. <laughs> oh sure. Well, it's such a legendary venue. Uh, is there a place uh, that you've played outside of those but that, that became a favorite spot, maybe because of memory or just because you look at some of the bills that you played on, you played with everybody and they used to have the package bills. So are there certain ones that stick out for you on that? Oh, yeah. I remember we did the Clark shows, uh, oh, yeah. TV shows in uh, Binghamton. Wow. Far from you. Yeah. And uh, I used to ride, they put me on these farm equipment things. I was in a some kind of loader one time and uh, another time on a wagon being pulled by a tractor and uh, I don't know, things like that. Yeah. They were like the first music videos. You yeah. Know? yeah. Isn't it amazing to think of how many legends were on each of those bills and now, you know, you look at the news and one star gets, you know, $1,500 a ticket. I know. 
I can't imagine. No. I can't imagine paying that. For no. no. My car. I know. I, I don't remember. I don't think I've ever owned a car that's worth quite that much. But the the <laughs> talent back then, and also the value you got for your money, it just speaks, I guess, volumes for the time that that was taking place. Um. Yes. It yeah. Does. I, I, was the question? Well, just that, I mean, you look at the the talent and the value uh, at that time, it goes to show you that maybe the difference in the music video, maybe that, or the music industry, maybe that's a better way for me to put it. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. And uh, it is a, well, it's like a pickup truck I used to sell for 1800 uh, Right. Oh, loaded. <laughs> and now, then they became 18000 and now they're 80000 Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. If you look back at the beginning of your career, if you could tell yourself something now, back then, what would it be? Uh, get a better manager. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I don't know. I yeah. probably would have, there's several things I would have done different, but not too many. Yeah. And, uh, because I, you know, I just didn't know yeah. a lot. It was going on in those days, but uh, and I was losing a lot of money. I knew that, but uh, that's another story for another time. Sure. And, uh, well, I can't think of anything. Mm. You know, I got to meet Richard Bloor and play uh, act in two Afghan War travels. I love it. Plus the Thunder of Drums with him and Charles Bronson. Yeah. Um, yeah so. Anyway, Arthur O'Connell. Yeah. So I became friends with Charlie and with Dick, and Dick I stayed friends with for 20 years, yeah. 61 until he passed away in 81. Yeah. So those are all moments. Amazing. And, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, Everly Brothers, I worked with them mm. and produced uh, Phil's first song for RCA. Another highlight, another moment, and. Uh, just it's just been I went to Nancy Sinatra's birthday party one time and Frank and yeah all these people were there and it was just amazing yeah you know? yeah I think sometimes I just uh, you know yeah. I don't like knock, knock on wood or whatever yeah and, uh, <laughs> I wonder you know mm -hmm. well my my current producer calls me the Forrest Gump of rock and roll. <laughs> and the irony of your song being in Forrest Gump is pretty amazing, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, they kind of like that because I, I just fell into these situations and met these people. Yeah. I met just about, I met all of them back. Oh, wow. Wow. Sammy Davis and Dean Martin and uh, got to hang with all of them. Yeah. And, uh, so it's been exciting and fun, and then there's some music. I got to play <laughs> yeah. with the best musicians in the world. Yeah. All the world. yeah. Everybody from Paul Schaefer to Paul McCartney. Yeah. <laughs> And we're going to talk more about that on tomorrow's show because we're going to take another short break and then we're going to play the second part of this interview tomorrow. So stay with us. We'll be right back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV Big Fox. Welcome back to Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV Big Fox. Thanks so much to M.A. Neal Financial Services for bringing us that interview with Dwayne Eddy. As I had mentioned, that was just part one. Tomorrow, we'll be joined by the legend again. I hope that you enjoyed it. It's so interesting to, to learn about his history, to learn uh, just about his amazing career and his obvious, you see it, his fondness for our area and uh, growing up here in the, at least the surrounding area. Uh, born in Corning. So what can we do for him? I asked the question at the beginning of the program. What can we do to recognize Dwayne Eddy? Yes, he is in the Steuben County Hall of Fame, which was great. Um, as many had said, long overdue, and we were happy uh, when he was, I guess not sworn in, when he was uh, put into the hall. Uh, so everybody was excited about that. I had a lot of momentum going. Now we've got to keep that momentum going. So what should we do? 
Uh, you can text me, call me, email me, and we'll talk with uh, Dwayne a little bit more tomorrow. And that's going to be our Good Friday edition of Frankly Speaking, talking with Dwayne Eddy. Uh, and I'll mention this tomorrow as well, but uh, thank you to everyone who maybe joined us for the first time hearing that uh, Dwayne was going to be on the program. Thank you. I appreciate it. I hope that you'll make us a part of your morning. But I'd also like to say hi uh, to all the people, and I think I might have mentioned it, uh, the, the circle it's called, Dwayne Eddy Circle. Um, it's a sort of fan club or a, a bunch of uh, fans of Dwayne Eddy and get together, and they have these amazing um, get-togethers that used to be in person. I'm happy now, as um, I was mentioning, because it's online get to see everybody just a great group of people i know we have some local members here but it goes all over the world uh, so thank you to everybody in the circle as well for maybe watching frankly speaking for the first time hopefully not last you can find us on youtube uh, we put the program up a little bit after it airs live on television on ydc uh, and then we also have the interviews posted on our facebook page so you can always check us out there see what we're up to here on frankly speaking so we have a couple of news stories to get to this morning, and luckily we have just a little bit of time uh, here on the back end. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have some fun guests coming up next week as well, so you'll just have to stay tuned for that. I'll get you that information on tomorrow's program. So let's talk for a moment, <laughs> talk about completely changing the topic, going from a rock and roll legend to the New York State budget. So there's no good way to segue that, but let's talk about it. Governor Hochul has not ruled out a second budget extension. So the 10th is uh, when this budget extension runs out. Uh, I guess we passed the first deadline, Hochul said. Yeah, April 1st, of course, was the deadline. We'll be looking at it again on Monday, of course. But it's more important to get it right, and I'm committed to getting it right. Obviously, the holdup, as we've mentioned, is bail reform and uh, housing issues as well. But bail reform, uh, the major really non-negotiator. I mean, what happened was, and, and actually I should mention this story. I was proud of this when I saw it. We predicted this on the program yesterday. So it was a very wonky topic, but what the governor was proposing was basically a change in our green energy policy here because she felt that and it got really into the weeds, but she felt, and rightfully so, that it was going to cost New Yorkers a lot because of high energy prices. Uh, but instantly, as soon as uh, the story came out that she was adding this to an already quote-unquote tense negotiation. Again, this negotiation is just between uh, three uh, Democrats trying to figure out how far left they're willing to go. Uh, kind of find, uh, it, it's, it's really kind of fascinating that this is where there's the holdup. But anyway, so the governor decides to throw in this really hot-button issue. Even though it shouldn't be, it's, it wasn't anything out of control. Uh, even for those, in my opinion, uh, that are very green conscious. Uh, but the, the groups that make a lot of money off of these green projects instantly came out and said it was a sellout to big oil and, and these type of things, where I think Governor, Governor Hochul's argument was a good point. This is not the time to hurt New Yorkers even more as energy prices are continuing. But again, there was a lot of uh, very technical language, uh, and I think the groups that were opposed to this exploited that lack of interest or lack of wanting to study uh, exactly what Governor Hochul was proposing. So my thought was she put that in because it was going to be a, another tense part of the bill uh, just so she could say, okay, I'll cave on this, uh, but you have to give me a little wiggle room on bail reform. It didn't work out exactly like she had planned because she's dropped it, it, hoping to get some leverage in the budget talks, but according to reports, and specifically from the New York Post, but elsewhere that I read today, it didn't seem to work. It just ended up making her look like she had caved. Uh, it didn't seem to be a well-thought-out plan, said one Albany insider. The whole thing makes no sense. Again, I, I think I, if I had to guess what was going on behind the scenes, Governor Hochul maybe putting some pressure on saying, hey, I'll, I'll put some other things in there you're not going to like if you don't give in this little bit on bail reform. But they're very hard line on this bail reform. Uh, what we're seeing is there's not a lot of uh, wiggle room at all, if any, uh, because if you look at what Governor Hochul is proposing with bail reform, saying, you know, she reads the, the tea leaves, that the, the polling shows safety is a major issue in New York and people are feeling less and less safe since bail reform. So, She's saying let's do really the, the most minuscule 
and those in the debates are saying absolutely not. So, to add on top of that, do I have to take a break? So, I do have to take a break, but... Uh, so I think the negotiations are going to be, I could see a second extension, maybe not, but I hope, and I know others have echoed this sentiment, I really hope that Governor Hochul stays strong on the bail reform, even if it means a couple of extensions, even if it, and I don't know, they say laughing stock or that they can't meet the deadline and there's all these negative effects. Seems like it's, it's less spending right now uh, as they're basically just paying their bills. Uh, so is it really a bad thing? Keep the extensions coming. All the employees of New York State are getting paid, so keep the extensions coming uh, and fight for this bail reform that the New York State residents have been demanding uh, since it was enacted. Uh, and let's keep the citizens of New York safe. So we have a couple other things, maybe on the budget, maybe a few things here on Trump, but I do have to take a short break. Stay with us. This is Frankly Speaking. I'm your host, Frank Aikum, and we are broadcasting live from the Hesselson studio here on Market Street in Corning. We'll be right back. We're back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV, Big Fox, broadcasting from the Hesselson's studio. A couple other news stories uh, before we run out of time. We've talked about the the budget in New York State for quite some time. There's two things I wanted to mention because it, it seems there's those in Albany, but also the federal level that just think we can constantly spend, constantly spend, constantly spend. And that's what we see here. You have AOC, Jerry Nadler, other New York politicians and they're pushing to extend health coverage to undocumented migrants i just don't know when does the money run out um so this is a congressional dele- delegation of new york obviously on the democrat side uh jerry nadler alexandria ocasio cortez they sent kathy hochel a letter saying we believe that health care is a human right regardless of immigration status now obviously the cost on this but what these uh, various progressive groups are very good at uh, always pushing. No, if you if you look at something, uh, you actually save in the long run. But have you ever noticed we don't end up seeing that savings uh, in the long run? So pushing that, and then, and this could tie in if you wanted to talk about it, but with uh, the uh, story of, of course, the biggest story, President Trump. So let me see if I can click on the wrong. Yeah. So. There's, and we talked about the last few days, but there's this sense from Trump supporters that there has been an all out attack on Trump since the beginning, whether it's the swamp, whoever, because he had the audacity uh, to win, as an article we had for you yesterday. And I think Bragg has played into, DA Bragg has played into, um, into that notion. And that's why the media is so concerned about how to cover it. Here's a, another example. And this is coming from city and state. State Senator Brad Holman Seigel, and maybe is how you pronounce it, uh, has been pushing bills specifically targeting targeting one man, and that is Donald Trump. Uh, I he, this is what he said. I take responsibility as a New Yorker, the original home state of Donald Trump, to ensure that the public gets the truth about his background. It's our uh, responsibility to bring those issues to bear. Do you know what that's in reference to? He wants to change the rules so now cameras are allowed in court. For one specific reason, for Trump. This, and hey, it's none of my business one way or the other. I'm just looking at it from, uh, from all sides. To me, if, well, it proves to me that many on um, the left and in the media did not realize or they have not learned from what happened uh, and they're they're forgetting yet again about the forgotten man and women that the, uh, then candidate trump kept talking about which was the people that feel that washington whatever their state wasn't speaking for them wasn't doing what was right for them but actually um a hindrance in their lives so donald trump talking about how the swamp was out to get him and doesn't it seem like people like this who are specifically targeting him for a bill, or people like District Attorney Bragg, who so many people, even CNN had a piece this morning saying this is not going to be easy, uh, essentially without coming around and saying it, it's a very, very weak case. So yes, Bragg gets the attention that he wants. It's kind of like a Adam Schiff scenario, gets uh, the attention that he wants. But in the long run, uh, and I think the media is trying to think about this right now, and uh, Bragg doesn't seem to be, but I think many uh, that don't like Trump are starting to think about, wait, is this actually helping 
Donald Trump. Uh, the polls are showing everywhere you look that he's the front runner uh, for the Republican ticket and that this is only helping him financially, of course, with donations, but also in the polling numbers. Let's take another short break and then we'll wrap things up here on Frankly Speaking. Please stay with us. That we're broadcasting live, excuse me, from the Hesselson studio here on Market Street. And we'll be right back. We're back with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC TV, Big Fox. I'm your host, Frank Acom. One last news story, and then we're going to wrap up here because we're just about out of time. Perhaps you maybe saw this. There's already kind of a pushback, as you'll see by the headline Anti vaccine activists. RFK Jr. is challenging Biden in 2024. What's interesting is this piece from the Associated Press, and I've, I've seen it in other uh, coverage of uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. announcing that he's going to challenge Biden. It is nothing but uh, going on and on about vaccines and um, his attack on vaccines and the comments he's made about vaccines. I, I don't normally I'd say, what, are they worried about him? And maybe you always have to be, uh, if, if you're a Democrat, worried about a Kennedy jumping in the race because you never know. So maybe that's why they're pushing it uh, this much, uh, hitting on the anti-vaccine part of it. Um, because, boy, it's, it's kind of odd. It's an odd feeling, isn't it, to have um, the media going after a Kennedy. It's a long shot. We know that. Um, and, and, again, President Biden has not yet declared that he's running for re-election. Uh, but he's not the only one self uh, self-help author, excuse me, Marianne Williamson, remember her from last time? She's also running. They, the media went after her uh, thoroughly, and she came out and spoke on that uh, later on, a few at that time. So there's our news for the day. I know we rushed through a couple quick things. Thank you again to Dwayne Eddy for being on the program, and thank you to everyone who tuned in, perhaps for the first time, to catch that great interview, a uh, great conversation, I should, I should say, uh, with Dwayne Eddy. And thank you again to M.A. Neal Financial Services for bringing us that interview we're going to have part two of that tomorrow morning so don't miss that uh maybe you have the day off for good friday or just set your alarm i think you're going to like part two of frankly speaking's interview with Dwayne eddy well have a great day everyone as always you can contact me i'd love to know what you think about that interview and about tomorrow's interview or if you have any uh, last minute questions things that you want to comment on so please contact me there. Have a great day, everyone. We'll be back tomorrow morning with Frankly Speaking here on WYDC-TV Big Fox. I'm Frank Acom, and I'm trying to find my button if you couldn't tell. There we go. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining us.